If this is your first time here, my name is Moses. I'm the lead pastor of Rosebrook, and we are continuing our sermon series called Intertwined, uh, Dating, Marriage, Singlehood, and Family Trauma, where we want to explore what the Bible says about the different stages of life, love, and all the messiness in between. And so in addition to uh, being a source of guidance for those of you in a specific stage of life, we also are hoping that these sermons uh, will lead to repentance if you feel convicted of some sin, or even healing for those of you who have dealt with relational trauma. So please continue to pray for the pastoral staff as I've encouraged all of us to be as vulnerable as possible where we can relate to any other content that we're preaching on. So far, uh, we've explored the topics of dating and marriage, and the feedback from many of you, uh, or all of you that I've heard from, uh, has been very encouraging. And so we're so grateful to the Lord uh, that he's been using these messages to bless you. Uh, praise God. I'm just really, really encouraged. And so you can check out those sermons on our YouTube channel via our link tree uh, if you're interested in getting caught up. Now today, as I shared with our members over the week, that we'll be exploring uh, the topic of neurodiversity, mental health, and relationships. And as I shared last week, you know, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough where more of my friends now are getting divorced rather than getting married. And so it's been heartbreaking to see uh, so many godly couples break up when memories of their weddings are still fresh on my mind. And if I were to sum up two of the most common reasons for why many marriages among millennial Christians in my circles are struggling, uh, the two most common reasons are related to either mental health or uh, issues with the idea of submission. And as we explored the topic of submission last week, you know, it's not what we typically think we, what it is. So check out the sermon if you, before you have questions about it and let, us, let me know if you have follow-up questions afterwards. But aside from the topic of submission that we talked about last week, we'll be exploring the topic of mental health and neurodiversity today. Now, before we go on, let me provide some definitions for those of you who are unfamiliar with the idea or the word neurodiversity. Uh, in very simple terms, <laughs> simple, um, just want to make sure it's number four on the slides too. Great. All right. So number one, neurodiversity is this idea that there's a natural diversity of human brains and how they function in just the world. Number two, neurotypical is referring to a person whose brain does not differ from the statistical norm. So this is like the majority of people and how they think, how they socialize, process information, etc. Number three, neurodivergent then is a person whose brain differs or diverges from statistical norms, like people with ADHD, autism, dyslexia, etc. And there's usually or typically a genetic component to it. So you're oftentimes, you know, it's a it's a characteristic that's often passed down from your parents or grandparents, etc. Now, I need to clarify neurodivergence and mental health conditions, there's some similarities and differences. Neurodivergence is often different from mental health conditions like anxiety or depression because it doesn't suddenly appear in adulthood or after a traumatic experience like many mental health conditions do. Uh, at the same time, you really can't talk about one without the other because neurodivergent people are at higher risk of other mental health conditions than neurotypical people. So if you have ADHD, you are two, or th uh, two times uh, more likely, I think, than neurotypical people to uh, be diagnosed with anxiety or depression, or sometimes both. Um, oftentimes, neurodivergent people with uh, people who have ADHD, for example, display autistic social traits, even though they may not be diagnosed with autism. And people with autism oftentimes have ADHD as well. And so to talk about one or like neurodivergence, you oftentimes have to talk about mental health conditions. And so as much as I want to um, talk about neurodivergence, I will inev inevitably have to talk about mental health as well. So a helpful analogy I once heard uh, was to think of neurodiversity as a diversity of operating systems available for computers. So what are some very popular, well-known operating systems that we have today? Shout it out. Uh, what? Uh, Windows, thank you. That is the most common one. What's, uh, what's another one? Linux. Linux. What else? Linux. 
Mac OS. Anyone else? iOS. Anyone else? Android. We know who the nerds are in church. Great. So these are very popular operating systems that many of us use, and maybe you didn't know what they were called. But these are, again, think of human beings as people with operating systems, all right? They all have one operating system. And which, with each operating system, you have different ways of, of running programs and solving problems. They all, uh, they may be trying to solve the same problem, but the way they get there is different. And even the viruses that infect our computers are different depending on your OS or your operating system. So oftentimes, viruses that impact Windows computers don't necessarily impact Mac OS computers. Statistically speaking, however, the most common OS or operating system that people still use is Windows. So the way most people run their programs, solve problems, interact with other computers, and even deal with bugs in their system are the same and generally relatable across the world because Windows is still the most common, commonly used operating system. So when people who use Windows and are familiar with Windows interact with someone running another OS like Mac or Android or Linux, or what we might call neurodivergent people, the coding, the bugs, the programs are awkward or unfamiliar to the statistical majority or the people that we call neurotypical. Even if these other minority operating systems do a better job at running some of these programs or solving specific issues that Windows may not do as good of a job doing. They are considered awkward, unfamiliar, foreign, etc. and oftentimes just dismissed like all the hate that iOS people get from Android users. Now, if our brain, if our brains are like operating systems, it's often the case that the majority or neurotypical, uh, the neurotypical population set societal standards for what is socially acceptable or preferred, especially for what we want in life partners, managers in our workplaces, friends, or coworkers without consideration that neurodivergent people are just as intelligent, empathetic, and loving as neurotypical people, but just because neurodivergent people behave differently, process information differently, communicate or socialize differently. Neurodivergent people are typically less likely, and this is proven, to be promoted, hired, or befriended. In other words, they're more likely to get bullied. Unfortunately, or rather not surprisingly, some circles in the, are, in the secular world are much further ahead in terms of being aware of and accommodating for our neurodivergent neighbors than churches oftentimes are. According to researchers, about 15 to 20% of the world's population is neurodivergent. That means about one in five people in this room. That means one in five children in our church could potentially be neurodivergent without knowing it, or maybe they do know. They could be individuals who don't socially fit in with the majority because their brains are wired differently. Now, is that their fault? Is it their fault that their brains are wired differently, that they're running different operating systems that the majority are not familiar with? Of course not. But it can surely feel that way for them because of the way socially constructed rules for what's socially acceptable can bully those that don't conform or can't conform to what's considered acceptable. Part of today's message is obviously trying to raise more awareness on neurodiversity, which will overlap with mental health conditions. But the other part will be to see how the gospel provides more hope for those of us wrestling with neurodivergent or mental health conditions, far more than we'd like to believe or maybe have known. So I have three points for today's message. The first is the maddening battle inside. The second is it's not your fault. And number three, 
longing for the resurrection to come. First point, the maddening battle inside. And most of our time will be spent from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 22 to 26. So let's read that together. And I have up here the NIV version. On the contrary, those parts of the body of Christ, or i.e. the church, that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are, rela- are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Friedrich Nietzsche, many of you have heard his name. He is the son of a Lutheran pastor who became a famous atheist philosopher. And and he's also one of the primary influences for Nazi ideology. He once claimed that Christianity is based on a, quote, slave morality, because it teaches that weakness and caring for the weak are virtues. It teaches that weakness, to embody weakness, to live out of weakness, and to care for the weak are virtues. Instead, he claimed that it's actually a point of honor for the, quote, strong to overcome the weak that hold the rest of society back. And you can see how that logic resulted in the Holocaust. In the world without God and universal moral standards, social Darwinism can justify bullying behavior by those in the majority or those who hold most power in society, usually historically are who are neurotypical people. Because you have to navigate different social groups, different social settings in order to manipulate, trick, and eventually rise to power to implement such harsh forms of persecution. After all, if the powerful are intellectually, socially, or even, quote, morally superior, why do they need to leave room for the socially awkward or for those perceived to be weak or incapable to adapting and thriving in society? Or if they do have a place in society, they are, they are meant for that, um, to be of the lower class. But for Christians, there's... Nothing in the Bible that says, blessed are the socially aware, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. There's nothing in the Bible that says, blessed are those with high emotional intelligence, for they will inherit the earth. Instead, the Bible is ripe with blessings for the poor, the weak, the merciful, the peacemakers, and those who mourn or grieve. Living with ADHD can be maddening. It's a never-ending battle between being hyper-focused and being distracted. People with ADHD like myself, we're either too energetic or straight-up exhausted. We're either outperforming others or we're at the brink of losing our jobs for underperforming. We're either at the center of attention for our extroversion or we're so afraid of being socially awkward that we just shut down. We're either eating too much or not eating enough. We're either exuberantly joyful, or we're utterly depressed and having panic attacks. That's the everyday experience of someone with ADHD. And even if you don't have ADHD, maybe you can relate to this maddening battle in our hearts and minds. The reality is that many of us who are neurodivergent or wrestle with mental health conditions are constantly feeling weak on edge, and mourning. For some of us, being weak is an option that we can choose to privately share with close friends if we want to share. But for others of us, being weak is a socially constructed reality that we only face when we're in public. And some of us are so terrified and so hurt and traumatized and bully, or have been bullied, that it's scary to be in public, to s- scary to even be at a church. Some of us can't hide the fact that 
we're what Nietzsche and many in society consider to be weak and dispensable. The moment we open our mouths or enter public settings, we literally bleed weakness. We don't make eye contact when we're supposed to. We change sub subjects and cut people off and talk too much. Or maybe don't talk at all. We're either too shy or rude, too loud, too quiet. We bleed weakness. And it's terrifying because whether it's true or not, we feel like everyone can see it all the time. And we feel judged for it all the time. And there's good reason to believe this. Again, statistically speaking, neurodivergent people and people suffering from chronic mental health conditions are less likely to get hired, get promoted, or to have friends, or to even find lifelong partners. This is another reason why we're in a constant state of mourning, or why we find it difficult, so difficult to get up in the morning, because sometimes it feels hopeless. I mean, based on the research, we have good reason to believe we don't belong in society, or that we're not necessarily playing the victim card if you feel like we're getting bullied. In contrast to Nietzsche and social Darwinism, we learn from verse 24 that God has intentionally weaved the church of the body of Christ together in such a way that socially, emotionally, financially, or physically strong are bound together with those considered to be, quote, weak. Jesus never intended his body, the church, to be a place where those considered to be weak are excluded or on the fringes of our communities. Instead, Paul says, teaches us that in verse 22, that the weak or the least important are actually the most necessary or indispensable. Why? Well, for Paul, he sees the weak, he hears the Christ. He actually centers the weak in such a way that the, primary, that the primary recipients of God's mercy and grace in the church are such people. The strong are blessed in order not to hoard or to stay exclusive amongst themselves to form their own cliques and social circles, but to be inclusive generous, and steward their social standing and, and their tangible resources in such a way that, that there's actual evidence of these things being used to bless the weak, to uplift the weak. And even more than that, the strong are dutifully bound to empathize with the weak because if one part of the body suffers, then what? Every part should suffer. And the reality is that there are a lot of us in the body of Christ that are constantly suffering in this way. Church, do you hear their cries? Do you see their suffering? Second point, it's not your fault. I can't emphasize that enough. It's not your fault. Verse 22, on the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. Vincent van Gogh is widely considered to be one of the most important and famous painters in all of art history. But his life was also very tragic, and it's widely known that he wrestled with severe mental health conditions. But what many don't know is that before he pursued painting, he actually pursued pastoral ministry, like his Dutch Reformed father and grandfather before him, which is the Dutch equivalent to Scottish Presbyterianism. But after studying theology and getting mentored by his theological professor uh, uncle, he failed his ordination exam because the exam committee deemed him socially unfit for ministry. And that categorization was a bit vague. People didn't understand what they actually meant today anyway. And so a lot of people have 
dug into his letters and, and, um, and eyewitness accounts of what Van Gogh was like. And according to a recent article in the International Journal of Forensic Science, Sciences, Van Gogh was most likely on the autistic spectrum. In addition to his mental health conditions, he was also neurodivergent. But because he displayed such passion for pastoral ministry, his denomination gave him a shot and gave him an opportunity to instead become a missionary and church planter in a coal mine community where the locals endearingly gave him the nickname Christ of the coal mines due to his sincere love for the poor. But after several years of attempting to start a church with these workers who work like 14, 16 hour days, six, seven days a week, who could obviously not participate in the everyday life of a church to help them get this thing started. The denomination removed them from the mission field because of a lack of progress and over concerns for social awkwardness. That's why you turn to art. Although people celebrate his life now because of the contributions he made in art, which seemed to have far exceeded what he could have possibly done in pastoral ministry. It still breaks my heart that he wasn't given the chance to pursue what he felt like was his true calling. Partly because no one knew what autism was back then. And in fact, the mysterious circumstances of his early death allude to the possibility that he may have actually ended his own life. People debate about how he actually died. It's not clear. People close to him seem to have described it as an accident, but it might be the case because they're trying to protect his reputation. And perhaps it was due to his loneliness or the constant bullying. Personally, it wouldn't surprise me if he ended his life seeing that he could never reach his full potential in ministry because the church didn't truly embrace him in his weakness and treat him with special honor as the Apostle Paul commands in verse 23. In one sense, we see the Apostle Paul acknowledging the diversity of the church not just in race, but also in terms of physical and socially constructed definitions of what it means to be strong and weak. In that sense, while every individual human being bears the image of God, an individual doesn't embody the full extent of what it means to be the image of God. Again, let me clarify this. An individual doesn't embody the full extent of what it means to be the image of God. Paul actually clarifies that it's the combination of the weak and the strong that defines what the church is and or ultimately what the image of God ultimately is. Because what happens is when we use an individual as the basis for the image of God, when we say you and I individually embody the image of God, we have a tendency to define what it means to bear the image of God based on what the majority of the individuals are like. Usually, those in power, those who set what it means to be, quote, normal. If the majority of individuals socialize a certain way or behave a certain way, we can start equating certain socially constructed norms as what God ultimately intended for his image in humanity. But this subjective way of defining the image of God excludes or even bullies those who do not fit the behavior or look or the looks of the majority of individuals just because someone isn't being sanctified the way you expect them to be according to how you see yourself and the majority of your friends and family being sanctified, it does not mean that God is not sanctifying them. It looks different. The bugs are different and the problems being solved look different, but it does not mean just because it doesn't fit what you expect that God is not working in them, that they're not displaying the image of God. A better approach for how we understand what the image of God is comes from 
again, the Dutch Reformed theologian, Herman Bobbing, who argues that the diversity, the entirety of individuals throughout space and time comprise the fullness of the image of God with Christ as the head. That means everyone who is both neurotypical and neurodivergent together comprise and define what the image of God is. This means that if God created humanity to function under a diverse set of operating systems, even before sin entered the world, then no single operating system is a true reflection of the image of God. Windows is not the image of God. Rather, the combination of all these diverse operating systems is what defines the image of God. So if being neurodivergent isn't inherently sinful or the result of sin, but we just have our own ways of wrestling with sin that differ from the way neurotypical wrestle with sin, then who are we to judge, dismiss, or criticize neurodivergent people for being awkward, difficult, or draining? Again, I don't want to dismiss the idea that neurodivergent people don't sin because we need to grow in self-control, gentleness, forgiveness, and other areas of our character like everyone else. But just like everyone else, neurodivergent people are here because we have much to teach the rest of the church through our perspectives and gifts, which are oftentimes forced to the fires of being bullied, overlooked, or ridiculed for most of our lives. It's also because of these fires that many neurodivergent believers can oftentimes confidently declare, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 9, 2, uh, 12, verse 9, that his power is made perfect in weakness. Indeed, your presence, my neurodivergent brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters wrestling with chronic mental health conditions, your presence is precious to us because you're precious to our Heavenly Father. In the end, the goal of sanctification isn't to become neurotypical. The goal is to become more humble, loving, and dependent on Christ. And that's a goal any follower of Christ, including neurodivergent people, can strive for by the grace of God through the Holy Spirit. This also means that for those of us wrestling with mental health conditions, rather than blaming yourself for being weak or unable to withstand traumatic situations that resulted in your condition, your mental health doesn't define you. Perhaps the better question to ask is, in what ways has God granted me, or as Paul writes in Philippians, gifted me this suffering to teach me greater humility, love for our neighbors, and greater dependence on Christ? Third and final point. Longing for the resurrection to come. In many ways, I'm so grateful to the Lord for our secular and unbelieving neighbors, especially in their contributions to our understanding of neurodiversity and mental health. The reality is that they have been our greatest advocates for our dignity and inclusion into mainstream circles of society. The Christians in that space have contributed to this progress as well, the sad reality is that the church as a whole is still decades behind where many secular spaces currently are. And if history teaches us anything, these struggles for integration and acceptance for the marginalized will not be fully accomplished in this side of history because discrimination and bullying will always recontextualize in the next generation because of the broken and sinful nature of humanity. Does that mean that we should not even try? Of course not just means that we ought to be that much more vigilant towards new forms and expressions of bullying and marginalization. Until Jesus comes back and makes everything better, we have to pursue these commands from the Apostle Paul. And because we know that Jesus is coming back to make everything better, we also have hope that he'll make even our, more, uh, our weak mortal bodies better to the point that he'll finally take away our tears. So Paul says in Philippians 3.20 verse uh, 3, verse 20 to 21. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we eagerly, we are eagerly uh, waiting for him to return as our Savior, because he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which 
He will bring everything under his control. So how do we get there? On what basis can we look forward to this final transformation and redemption of our physical bodies and minds? Again, 1 Corinthians 12, 22. He's, uh, Paul says, in the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. And while our presentable parts need no special treatment, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. When we consider Paul's commands to treat the weaker parts of the body with special honor, we must remember, we must remember that apart from Christ, All of us, even those of you who are neurotypical, are deemed weak, unpresentable, and unworthy. Because in our sin, we truly don't deserve any special treatment. But as Paul reminds us, when one part suffers, every part suffers. And God saw our suffering because of the cosmic brokenness of the world, and He sent Jesus to make it all better. Jesus came to earth and saw our suffering, and he wept with us. He saw our suffering, and he suffered too. But not only did he suffer because we suffered, he suffered in our place because we deserved to suffer because of our sin. And through his suffering and his death and sacrifice on the cross, he was able to give his honor as a child of God, as a son of God. God the Father, so that we can all rejoice in our new status as sons and daughters of God as well. This is why we as Christians, that's why we go and now do likewise. We believe and cherish what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. And we ask, how can we not go and do the same for others? Whose shoes we were once in, in being undeserving of God's kindness and grace. We treat the less honorable with special honor because we see ourselves in them in that God gave us special honor through Christ's death and uh, death and resurrection. We suffer with those suffering from mental health conditions because we know what it's like to suffer in our own sinfully weak minds even to this day. But just as Jesus made us honorable by faith, regardless of our sinful weaknesses, We too seek to honor those who are weak and we rejoice together when we do. Contrary to Nietzsche and toxic social media personalities, relating to and uplifting the weak is not a form of slave mentality. Instead, to use our privileges and gifts to empathize with and uplift the weak is a true meaning of strength. This is what our Savior demonstrated, the true, strong Savior that we worship. To love when it's difficult and costly is far more difficult and far more indicative of strength than to selfishly love those already like us. Friends, that is a true meaning of strength, just as Christ demonstrated for us on the cross. So let us look to Christ and lean on him to become a church that seeks to treat the weak with special honor. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray and confess to you now that we have not always done a good job being patient, loving, kind, and and accepting and being inclusive of our neurodivergent friends next to us, our neighbors, those suffering from chronic mental health conditions that they may know or or may not know of. And Lord, for those of us who know that we have certain conditions that inhibit our ability to socialize and control our emotions, Lord, we confess to you that it's been hard, that it's oftentimes been lonely, Yeah, Lord, I pray that you may just give us, at the same time, the maturity to not blame others only, but to have the courage to seek help, to get medication, to get therapy, 
whatever we need to also be healthy, to pursue health. That we don't selfishly blame others for our problems, and that we don't selfishly expect everyone to embrace us, even though we are not being responsible and getting help ourselves. Give us, grant us humility in that sense, and give the rest of our community the humility and patience to continue to love and embrace those who do not fit the neurotypical mold. Help us to be a church again that seeks to treat the weak with special honor. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.